everybody, welcome. I see that we're already up to 31 participants. So thank you Great. everybody for joining tonight. It's a beautiful evening. I'm sitting outdoors. And for those of you who have not joined us before, this is called In Conversation. And it's a virtual program. We started at the Arts Council of Princeton and we wanted to kind of break down the barriers between artists and art collectors and art enthusiasts and Tim Andrews is a former board president for the Arts Council of Princeton. He also supports our artists and residencies right now. Um, and he's also on our advisory board. And he is, and, and same as me, we are really well, uh, thrilled to welcome Jim Jansma tonight. And if you do Hello. not know who Jim Jansma is, uh, he shows with uh, Ruth Morpeth Gallery locally. And he has shown all over the world, and I'm not going to get into a lot of his background because that's what Tim is going to do tonight. Um, they're going to have an hour-long interview, and I think that you are going to be really, really um, enriched by this conversation. So I will log out, and I will let Jim and Tim take over, and thank you, Tim and Jim, for joining us tonight, and I will see you later. Great. See you in about an hour, Maria. Thank okay. you, Maria. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Jim, welcome. Uh, we really uh, are excited about having you this evening. So thanks very much for agreeing to, to come on, the, on the, our little event here. Well, thanks for asking me. It's a real privilege to be here. I hope I, hope I can live up to the, the billing. <laughs> I'm sure you can. I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. Um, so, so let's sort of get started. I like to sort of learn a little bit about, about sort of, you know, where people are from and sort of what, what the early impressions were in terms of art. So, you know, tell us about where you grew up and, and, and your first few years. Okay. Uh, I'm from Iowa originally. So a uh, small town, Iowa. Yeah. Um, I think there were all of 50 kids in my graduating class. So, um, hmm. yeah, pretty typical middle class Midwest kind of life. Um, without a real exposure to art, art was not part of my life growing up to any extent. Um, it wasn't until later that, that I found it. And, you know, when I did, it was a real revelation. In high school, though, uh, at one point we had a, a new art teacher come. And again, it, you can imagine with such a small town, small school, the offerings were slim. Mm -hmm. And they offered a pottery class. And I took it and, you know, really enjoyed it, but never had any thought that this would lead to anything for me until later when I got into college. Really? I thought I wanted to be a farmer. And, I just, but so, I think I always, you know, enjoyed working with my hands or the idea of more physical work and that yeah. connection to nature. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that was sort of some dream I had. Um, I, Certainly never saw myself as an office person or working that kind of a life. So in so so even growing up, even before your high school years, were you interested in art, or you know, uh, you know, were you working out in the farm with your with your with your family or something, or were you were you involved in art at all before that high school class that you remember? Not really, not at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I and you know I had no exposure to it real per se. You know, as many people so. I, you know, we didn't go to museums, and, and so that mm -hmm. was something very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. And so you went to high school, then you went to, where'd you go to college? So I, so I started off at uh, state school, um, Northwest Missouri State University. Okay. And, and so my older brother, who was also going to the school at that time, was dating an art major. <laughs> okay. And I... I had told her, I, you know, oh, I took a pottery class. I really loved it. And she said, well, you should take a class, you know. And I thought, that, you know, I was, I thought that was the realm of special people who, who you know, mm -hmm. I didn't know impressionism from expressionism. And, and so I was way too intimidated. And it was, if it wasn't for her encouragement, I probably never would have found my way over to the art building. What were you and, studying? What were you studying before you took your, your art class? You know, I was a freshman, so I was just taking okay. general general yeah. classes and yeah. not knowing knowing I wanted to be in college, but not sure why. Um, but once I found the art building and took my first pottery class, 
It was done deal. You know, I knew that mm -hmm. I found the place and the people that I could, that I was looking for. And, uh, you know, it's pretty strong commitment at that time like that. This is something that I wanted to pursue. So in, in your college, you know, curriculum, how much art, what was sort of the balance of the courses and, and was there really a large ceramic program or was it well-rounded in all types of art and did you do other kinds of art? Yeah, no, well, it's interesting because when, you know, I had made up my mind, I just want to do pop. And, and so I took all the pottery classes I could and they finally came up to me and said, you have to take drawing, painting, design, mm -hmm. art history, and I was resistant because I don't need that. I know what I want to do. I want to make, make pots, you know? <laughs> um, and, and, and so I did. And, and, you know, which of course, you know, opened everything up and you started seeing things in a larger context. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it was really good for me that they finally forced me to do that. Um, and, it, but I didn't, so at, at that same time, after I had taken my one beginning class of ceramic, um, near my home in Des Moines was a museum called Living History Farms. And, and like the name implies, you could go there. There was the Pioneer Farm, the mm -hmm. 1900s Farm. They had a little village with a woodworker, blacksmith, and potter. And so me... Uh, thinking I knew, knew more than I did, you know, showed up one day and said, hey, you should give me a job. I know all about this. Um, and the potter there- This is, this is in college? Throwing this me is... out said, you know, if you want, you can come in. I won't pay you, but you can stack firewood, mix clay, do all those things, which I did for a while. And then I ended up apprenticing to him for a couple of years. So this was after so I, college? Was this after college or this? In was... between. It took me 10 years, 10 years to get my undergraduate degree. <laughs> what were you doing? What were you doing? Uh, rather than going to college, to classes, what were you doing besides the uh, ceramics? I mean, was that, was that ceramic? It was filling in the time or? Yeah, that's it. So I would do college. Then I would work at this living history farms where we okay. made reproduction of, you know, crocs and jugs from the 19th century. Um, then I'd go back to college for a little bit, and I would do that. So that was kind of back and forth for about three or four years okay. of, of that. And so at that museum, we were very authentic. So we had a wooden kick wheel, a horse mm. turn clay mixer, uh, and then we fired all the pots in a wood burning kiln where we would, um, as they would do at the time, throw salt in at the end of the firing, and the mm -hmm. salt becomes a vapor, and it creates its own glaze. And, and so I became very enamored with firing with wood at that time. So sort of so, that chemical reaction, sort of that chemistry that happens that, that you have really not that much control over, right? I mean, it's sort of going on. Uh, I mean, you're controlling yeah. it, but it's, it's less control than you have today, I would guess. Exactly. And that was one of the things I really liked. You know, of course, it would appeal to a 19-year-old to be staying up all night, stoking wood into a 2,000-degree kiln. You threw this salt in and it becomes a vapor and, mm -hmm. and the sodium from the salt reacts with the silica and the clay so it makes that glassy surface. But yeah, no, I, I, I love that um, and, and became very interested in this whole idea of wood firing. Hmm, interesting. So then you completed your undergrad and, and did you think, okay, this is going to be my career and it's going to be making pots, to use your, your phrase. Or, right. Or what Although you think I, didn't com I didn't complete my undergraduate okay. degree. Okay. Um, so one of the next things that happened is I found out of a, about a workshop in Tennessee at a craft school mm -hmm. where a Japanese potter was coming over to build a medieval-style wood-burning Japanese kiln hmm. called an onagama. Okay. And I got a scholarship to go to Tennessee to work on building this kiln, which was a great experience. Came back to Iowa and was, I, you know, I want to build this kiln. <laughs> Being again, young, naive, and like 20 years old and not thinking of in practical terms. Um, so actually at that time, the girl I was dating, um, who was also a potter, said my uncle has a farm, a pasture, and maybe he'd let us build a kiln there. And we found an old abandoned brickyard where we could kind of go 
take bricks. Um, and we built, we built an Onagama kiln in Iowa, and this was like 1980. And, uh, you know, we started firing it with uh, friends and community. And, uh, you know, had, it was a really, really great experience. And uh, so it was yeah, a so we, fairly large collection of, of people that were, that, were, that were doing pottery in the, in the community. I mean, it's, it's an interesting yeah. dynamic of, of, of how, where are those folks from and what was going on? And how'd you all get together? They were just all my, our social friends. Okay. But, you know, it was like that. And that's what was so great about it. It was such a communal thing. People would bring out food. They'd stay up all night with you, you know, because we would fire those kilns for five to seven days mm -hmm. at that time around the clock. And, and so, yeah, they, they all came out and, and just would always lend a hand. And we had a lot of people that were really just supportive of the whole idea. And, and so it was, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And so after we had done that for a couple of years, and then it was time to, okay, if I'm going to get an undergraduate degree and do this, it's, it, you know, I'm now in my mid twenties and maybe I need to think about doing this. And the best school for ceramics, for undergraduate ceramics was the Kansas City Art Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, these Kansas City Art Institute, and, you know, many great people had come from there. So I just drove down there, applied to go to school there and, and was, well, fortunately accepted and spent two years at the Kansas City Art Institute to get my undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. Very well regarded school. So we have a little question from the audience. Is that the same as a Raku uh, kiln that you were describing, mm -hmm. the Japanese kiln, which is, of course, I think a Japanese no, it, style also. No, it's not. Yeah. Although, um, at Raku, as we commonly know in the United States, you, you kind of heat up the kiln usually with a little gas, and when the kiln gets hot, you pull the pots out and then put them in a combustible material. Yeah. You know, that create an effect. So with the anagama, what happens is you burn long and slow over a long period of time to very high temperatures. What happens is during the firing, ash from the wood burning lands and accumulates on the pot. Mm -hmm. And as that temperature gets hot enough, that ash actually melts mm -hmm. and becomes a blade. So, so it sort of fuses. Run, it'll run in like rivulets down the sides of the mm -hmm. pot. Yeah. And you get markings from the flame having to pass through, find its way around, and deposits of charcoal on it. So, um, so all the all the surface is um, dictated just by the burning of the wood and where pots are located in position. Yeah. So, so you go to Kansas City, and you're from this little small town, which I can really relate to. I grew up in a tiny little town of 100 people. A small oh graduating God. class, et cetera. So I totally get that in Indiana. So I, I you know, so oh, very Indiana, well, very good. So I sort of get the whole thing. And I lived in Kansas City for three years. So I, I so far we're tracking pretty well. So oh, that's great. So, so after graduating uh, in Kansas City, did you stay there, or, or what was your sort of path, you know, uh, next in terms of starting your career, more formally starting your career? Right. So I, I did the two years there, and uh, and then I applied to graduate school, mm -hmm. and. The lineage of the trajectory was always Kansas City Art Institute to uh, the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University. Okay. So I applied to Alfred. Um, very, again, well-known school, very difficult to get into. You know, I really didn't have much thought that I would be accepted, but it was just, you know, almost mandatory that you apply. So I applied to Alfred and, and amazingly I got accepted into the, the MFA program there. <laughs> so that got me from the Midwest out East going, going to Alfred. Mm -hmm. And how long is that program? Is that a two year program also? Two, yeah, two year program. And Very so, rigorous. Yeah, I was gonna say, so how, how did that program compare to the Kansas City program? And how did it sort of how did, how did you feel your progression was occurring sort of professionally and not, not professionally making money necessarily, but sort of as you're growing your art and your form, you know, how did you. Yeah, exactly. Progressing? Right. When, you know, so I went into Kansas city as a, as a potter throwing on the potter's wheel, mm -hmm. but you know, I had started questioning whether that was really the path for me. Um, and, and so when I got to Alfred, it was sort of that, when I first started it, it, that sort of carried on. I was making pots, but not sure that's where I wanted to be. Um, mm -hmm. 
and it was during that two years there that I transitioned to hand building and working in a lower temperature clay and was starting to work more sculpturally. Hmm. So um, it was tough. Uh, what was tough? It was what very was tough, tough about it? Idaho there. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's what ended up happening at that point. So the program was tough because of the rigor or because you were, you were also shifting from the potter's wheel to a more you know, sculptural approach? Yeah, I think both, you know, you, you're, you're in there with eight other grad students, well, 16 grad students, it's a two year program, they take eight each year. And these people are coming from very different backgrounds all over the country, all over the world. And it was very demanding. You, you know, you were given a stipend, but you were expected to be in the studio all the time. You lived, practically slept in the studio. Wow. And, and there's six faculty members in ceramics. And so you were scrutinized at every turn. Mm -hmm. I took to going in and working from midnight till six in the morning just to avoid people so I could actually have the space to work, which didn't sit well with them. But, um, but it was a great experience because, you know, the facilities are amazing. The faculty is amazing. The other students were probably even key to, to, to my progression, you know, was just absorbing what everybody else was doing. And why the shift from the wheel, you know, what, 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 what was your thought or what, what sort of moved you from the wheel to doing more sculptural work? Was there some sort of, did something occur or you're sort of just your interest shifted or from a commercial perspective, you sort of were thinking, gosh, I should be doing something a little bit different than, than I'm doing. Sort of what was the, what, what was the driver you think? Yeah, I think it goes back to, you know, when I was at that living history farm mm -hmm. and idea of making production pots and making, you know, dozens of the same form over and over. It was a great way to learn. You learn your, your craft that way. And I could throw well, but I wasn't sure that was going to satisfy what I needed out of the material. Mm -hmm. um, repetition probably isn't my forte. And <laughs> so I would find myself getting, getting a little bored. And, and I wasn't much of a decorator. And so they were, I could throw good, straight, functional pots but I actually didn't find them to be that interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, yeah, so I wanted to find out some, some other ways to, to work with the material a little more expressionistically, you know, a little more mm -hmm. personally. And uh, not that you can't do that with Posca. There's so many great potters out there doing amazing work. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't really feel like maybe that was the right path for me. So after the MFA, um... Where did you go and what were you thinking about you know the life ahead well what i was thinking is wow kansas city art institute alfred university i'm set i'm going to go get a gravy train tenure tr track teaching job um so you want to teach had you had you been thinking all along you wanted to teach or or, or was I that did, yeah and then it just seemed like the natural way to go you know mm -hmm. um, you, you, you're supportive while you continue to do your artwork but I quickly realized that you had to pay your dues for a few years and um, teaching jobs, no matter what, are going to be very competitive and hard to come by. So what I did end up doing right after uh, graduate school was taking on the uh, artist in residency position at Peters Valley Craft Center, mm -hmm. which is up in the Delaware Water Gap in Layton, New Jersey. Okay. So uh, situation there was it, it it's a uh, center where people can come and study with many different ceramic artists. So like I would invite ceramic artists to teach, students would come um, and, and study with them. And I was kind of facilitating that program. Mm -hmm. um, so the, yeah, we, when I got there, the place was kind of in bad shape. It had been on hard times. And we spent a lot of time upgrading the facilities, building new kilns getting people in and uh, you know, I was there for 10 years doing that. So you um, were doing your art or you were working there or you were more of an administrative? Well, it sounds like a little bit of an administrative kind of role or something too. Yeah, it was, it was both. So the trade-off was, the trade-off was they didn't pay you, okay. but they gave you a place to live in the studio. We ran programs during the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, then in, through fall and winter, you had the place to yourself to make work. So, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so it, it was a little bit of administrative, and then you had studio time. 
And when did you start selling work? What, a point, what point in your, in your career, either in school or, or you know, at some point, what, when did you sort of start the commercialization of what you were doing? I, um, I don't think I ever <laughs> started the commercial. Well, commercialization might not be the right word, but when did you start selling your work or finding, finding yeah, I, your work? You know, some at Peters Valley, I would have some exhibitions, um, shows here and there, people coming through and buying work. Um, probably not until really I came down here to Hopewell and mm -hmm. then um, got on with, with the Morpeth Contemporary Gallery that, that yeah. uh, you know, that I started having a, a, a regular place to show and sell work. So you were at Leighton for 10 years, I think you said. And yeah. then when did you leave there and come, I guess, to Hopewell? Um, yeah, so I was, so I was at Peters Valley mm -hmm. and then there was a, a ceramic artist, many people are gonna be very familiar with her, Toshiko Takeizu. Okay. And she's from New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, was from New Jersey. And she taught at Princeton University, mm -hmm. and she had been at Princeton for a long time. Um, we became close friends and uh, worked together. And when she retired, uh, I took her position at Princeton. Okay. So that's when we moved down here to Hopewell. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was for a while, I was at Peters Valley and Princeton at the same time. Then we moved down here, and then I was at Princeton for 10 years. So, and that, that got us here to Hopewell. And what, what's the program at Princeton or what was the program at, at Princeton like then? Because, you know, I think many of us who are from the area think of Princeton in, in about a lot of things, social sciences and physics and a whole lot of other things. You know, perhaps ceramic art is not the first thing, you know, that people might think of. So how big is that program and sort of what did you, what did you accomplish while you were there and what, what was that interaction with students like? Yeah, right. It's a, uh, and I think Princeton is actually one of the few Ivy League schools, I could be wrong on this, that even offers visual arts and, and mm -hmm. things like ceramics, and, and that may have changed now. Um, so it was an elective class, and, and so it was interesting. You know, they weren't going to let students get too carried away with ceramics. You know, <laughs> they had bigger, bigger goals than, than ceramics. So, you know, but the students were wonderful because, you know, they're high achievers, very motivated. Um, I like teaching there because all I had to do was teach the class and there was very little commitment outside of that. Okay. And, you know, like most places, we we're down in the basement, um, hidden away and nobody came down and bothered us. And I was fine with that. So, you know, I, I had my students and uh, um, yeah, it was really, it was really enjoyable. And um, so when did you leave Princeton? I left there, so ultimately Princeton, you know, was never going to be a tenured position, mm -hmm. and and it got to the point where I need to have a little more security, mm -hmm. and, and so I left Princeton 03, I think, okay. was, was the last year I was there. And so. so, and so you left there, and what's life been since then? I know you mentioned uh, Ruth Morpath and her gallery. When did you start showing your work there? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Probably around around 2000, I would say. Okay, so just before you left the university. Right. I, okay. Yeah, exactly. We bought an old farmhouse outside of Hopewell, mm -hmm. um, an old run-down farmhouse that we're spending the rest of our life remodeling. <laughs> uh, we've made progress, but uh, you know, it's a beautiful end of a dead end country lane, oh, and yeah. all the woods around us are all uh, preserved land. Mm -hmm. So, so we have a really kind of unique setting back here. That's and, great. Uh, yeah, so you know we enjoy that and, and the Hopewell area. So yeah, it's worked out really well for us. That's great. So, so we're going to see some pictures of your work in a second. But sort of as you've gone through this progression and teaching at Princeton, sort of how would you describe, you know, what you're sort of focusing on or have been focusing on for the last few years? And then we're going to show some of your work. But sort of, you know, what what sort of drives you? What motivates you? And and what what's you know how does some of the work sort of take form? Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, throughout my entire time doing clay, it's always been about the material. I think material and process. You know, and clay is such a versatile material and can take many forms and shapes and imitate and mimic other things. But I've always hewn pretty closely to the origins of the material, you know, the, mm -hmm. 
mm. keeping it very earthy, keeping it very um, visceral and, and, and uh, tactile. So, and, you know, talking earlier about wanting to move away from pot, mm -hmm. you know, throughout, I've, I have done figurative work and, and such, but I've come back to the vessel form as um, not a limitation because I don't worry about function and I don't mm -hmm. worry about decoration, but I find there's a lot of room for me to explore within that sort of confine of, of the vessel. I don't mm -hmm. find it limiting at all, actually. Um, so that you sort of, it's interesting how you've come back to the vessel. I mean, having started there and then sort of explored, 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 and now you've come back largely to vessels. You have other works, but I mean, that, that's interesting that you've come back to it. Is that because you think you wanted to sort of show that it could be different than this repetitive, you know, um, uh, activity that you were so engaged in as a 19 year old? Or what do you think brought you back to vessels? Yeah, I think, um, it, well, I, I understand it's the language of the vessel. Um, you know, there's something about volume in the interior space that, that always appeals to me. Um, you know, I was doing work based on the figure for a while. It, it wasn't quite literally figurative. And, and I sort of felt I was going to run into a real dead end there. But hmm. somehow, you know, with working with uh, in different aspects of vesselness, which is basically some sort of sense of hollow containment, and that may be as, really as far as it goes, I find it a lot of room to, to uh, explore that. Hmm, interesting. Well, let's switch and let's look at a, let's look at a couple of pieces here, a few pieces. I'm going to share my screen here uh, with our group. And with luck, people will be seeing um, some artwork here. Are you seeing something there? Yeah, I'm seeing that the, a, a two-piece wall panel. Awesome, yeah. So that's so tell us about this, you know, I, I, before we get into vessels, and I've got certainly vessels coming up here in a second, but um, I was really fascinated by this and I love the colors you use and, and, and sort of the glazing that you do. But um, so this is almost like a, this, this sort of reminds me of sort of a, a painting, like a landscape painting. So how do you, you know, when you're selecting sort of the, the form something's gonna take and are you telling a story or sort of how does this sort of unfold this kind of a piece? Right. So when I talk about vessel, of course, this, this I don't consider vessel at all. Right. I consider this painting. Yeah. And, and even more painting than sculpture. You know, if I, I'm, I'm working within the four corners of a, of a painting format. You know, this could take any shape, theoretically, sculpturally. Um, you know, one of the nice things working on a vessel or something three-dimensional is you can't take in the entire composition in one look. You know, you have to work, go either turn or walk around the piece. Mm -hmm. And I think with these, I wanted to put it all out there, you know, where you can read it all in one one shot. Mm -hmm. And they could be paintings. And I have done some paintings, you know, on my own. Um, but I actually like what happens with glazes and, and the interaction of glazes which I'm sure we'll talk about more as we get going. Yeah. So this is actually, you know, really just textural painting with glazes. This is the approach to that. And what's the process of this kind of piece compared to, you know, probably many of us have, have done some throwing and, and et cetera. So what's the process of this piece? How is it sort of created? So, I mean, I roll out big, big flat slabs of clay mm -hmm. and then I start working on this surface. So I'll add wet clay and, drag and push and, and uh, scrape the clay. And then uh, a lot of multiple glaze firings along the way. Um, so these, and with all my work, um, oftentimes they're fired five, six, seven, mm. up, up to 20 times. It gets a little ridiculous. But, you know, it's, it, and it's sort of like paint too. If you put all the colors down at once and you fire them, you're gonna end up with mud. And so, you know, I'll put colors down, they'll melt, they'll fuse, and then I, and then I have something to respond to, and I'll add additional colors on top. And so, you, you know, you, you get little areas and even large areas where, where there's, the colors and glazes are interacting with each other. And how much, how much predictivity is there? How much can you predict what it will be? So you put it in the kiln, and then you bring it out, how long does it take to fire? And, 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 and 
how, how close is your guess of what it's really going to look like when you pull it out? Right. So that's, that's a great, that's a great question. Cause this goes back to the wood firing. Yeah. And the wood firing was all about this unpredictable nature mm -hmm. of chance and not knowing right. what you're going to get. Um, and that's something I've embraced throughout. So when I glaze fire it, there's a lot, a lot of chance and randomness, which I look for, mm -hmm. you know, it may make chance may make better decisions than, um, what I might choose to do. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is when I fire, you know, whatever the first firing is, that gives me something to respond to. Okay. And then I work the surfaces from there, you know, adding, subtracting, building on them. Um, so I'm sort of, I guess, trying to orchestrate the randomness and chance of it. Mm -hmm. But whenever I think I know what it's gonna come out, it, of course it never does. And then you have to kind of sit back and deal with that for a while and then change your expectations and go back into it again. So if you're and doing so, something, I'm sorry, go ahead. I did one thing that, so when I was doing the wood firing, you know, we would fire the kiln for five, seven days, nonstop. You know, you put all your eggs in that basket. Mm -hmm. Now I fire in an electric kiln, yeah. computerized, low temperature. So I put the pieces in, basically press the button, go home, sleep, and when I come back the next day, it's done. And so then I feel more connected to, I can bring it out the next day, mm -hmm. look at it, immediately respond to it if I want to, glaze it, put it back in the kiln, and, mm -hmm. and fire. So I can fire like every single day. And so it's almost you know a continuation of the making process, the mm -hmm. glazing process. So, so it's very active. And in the glazing, and so you could, I think you said 20 up to 20 different, different times in the kiln. Are you looking, are you, are you, as you're doing that, is it about the color, the texture, a combination of those two things? Sort of what, what are you trying to seek? What's your, and, and, and then secondly, sort of when do you know you're finished? If you uh, ever are finished, like what's, what, yeah, no, how do you know it's, that, it's, right? It's insane. Yeah, I know, I, you know, yeah, a combination of color, texture, um, you know, I may feel like 80% of it's really great, but there's a little area over here. And once you kind of set yourself on that, you can't let it go. You know, it's going to annoy you constantly. So, you know, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just put a little something here, put a little something here. And then sometimes it's sweeping changes and I'll just hmm. obliterate the whole thing and cover it completely over with glaze. And, uh, but what happens is, you know, that some of that from what you did previously emerges from, from the firing, right? Mm. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's always this push-pull. And knowing when it's done, yeah, I think when it leaves the studio. Okay. But I, I mean, and we'll look at some of them. There's many pieces that I've shown, fired, you know, finished and gone back like two years, five years later and started glazing and reworking them. That's amazing. I don't think I've ever actually had a ceramicist say that before. Is that a No, it's a little crazy. Thing? So like this piece right here, yeah. It initially, there was no neck to it. There was no top to it. Okay. It was a, a it came in and it, and, and the, the top of the piece was just a small opening. Um, so top being, so this was the top right here? Exactly. From there okay. on up. Okay. And, and so in the studio, it, I think I even showed this at, at Morpeth at one point, and then it came back. And sitting in the studio, I thought, you know, that opening is just a little too tentative and, and it and bothered me. And so I just start, this is something you're not supposed to be able to do. Uh, <laughs> it's to add wet clay to dry fired clay. Yeah. Um, I just come up with all these little tricks to do that. So I built this on top. Now the very top part, that kind of opening flowering this part. This right here, yeah. Yeah. That actually was initially connected to the base of the piece. In other words, that so this was, was down here. It was move up, up. Move it was up, up here, there, right there. I see. So this. So, when area I, so this is actually is an exact impression of the surface on top of the of the large volumetric pool. I see. Interesting. So it, that was going to be there when I popped it off. I just liked the, the form it made by by impressing onto the surface. Yeah. And so, so I just took it and inverted it and made that the top. Wow. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. So this is inverted. This was sort of over this, like almost like a crown. Yeah. Right? So it's almost like a casting or a negative impression of that shape there. Yeah, interesting. And is this hollow? Yeah. So this is hollow, and is this tube also hollow? The connector is this all? Yeah, the whole thing is hollow. Oh, interesting. Okay, great, beautiful. And, huh? and so yeah, I started going back a couple of years ago. I started going back to all my old work and started remaking them. And I spent about two years not actually making new work, but just reworking all my older pieces and reglazing wow. them and, and adding clay onto them and rebuilding. So we've got a couple of questions in the queue I sort of want to just share right now. Uh, one is sort of getting back to Alfred just for a second. Um, you know, who were some of your mentors, uh, either at Alfred or elsewhere? Um, yeah, my mentors, of course, you know, um, in the big picture, of course, I grew up uh, and introduced to the ceramic. And the first time I saw, as with many people, the work of Peter Volkos. Mm -hmm. who, mm -hmm. who, you know, it's probably like you know, the father of, of modern ceramics and that, you know, that, of course, it's, you know, very male, very aggressive, but, um, you know, that, that really push-pull and, and abstract expressionism. So he was always a big, big uh, mentor of mine. Um, mm -hmm. Ken Ferguson at the Kansas City Art Institute, the chairman of the department there, you know, he was, and, and there were many, but at Alfred, um, the man who, who really taught more of the sculptural end of ceramics, Tony Hepburn, was, was also a big influence mm -hmm. on me. Another question from the audience, you know, you, you mentioned uh, growing up in a small town and sort of in this farm community, uh, and, you know, clearly you've not followed that path. You know, uh, in the early days, was your family confused? Were they supportive? Were they thrilled? Were they not thrilled? Sort of what was your family's reaction to, to your career choice and your sort of, you know, avocation, vocation, art as a life? Um, yeah, my family, you know, I, I would say they were uh, sort of ambivalent. You know, I think my father's was find a trade you can fall back on so you can earn yeah. a living. Yeah. But hey, if you're happy, that's fine. Um, you know, they, they were supportive enough, but I mean, I don't think they really embraced, but uh, they certain, certainly weren't an impediment to it. So. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So you mentioned the kiln you're using. Now I'm going to switch back to another piece here. Sure. Um, so you mentioned this high tech kiln that you use. Um, is that the only kiln you use or do you do some wood fired or do you do any of these other kind of, uh, you know, processes that you've talked about earlier? No, now, now I'm just doing uh, the electric kiln. Okay. And, and, you know, I got, I was in a situation where I don't have access to, um, the wood burning kilns anymore and mm -hmm. at first that bothered me and now you know I I completely embraced this mm -hmm. um, you know I remember years ago at Peters Valley a student came to me and said you know you're so lucky you have all these kilns these wood kilns these <laughs> gas kilns and all of these great tools and all I have is an electric kiln in my basement <laughs> and I thought you know that's not what's holding you back you know you mm -hmm. take what you have and you find a way to make it work for you and, and so I find so much more freedom and, and uh, um, p potential with just a simple electric kiln yeah. uh, than, than I probably ever did any other way of firing work. Is it more predictable? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or is it not any more predictable than a wood burning kiln or a wood fired kiln? So, so the wood burning kiln, you are dependent on the action of the firing. Mm -hmm. You know, the wood burning, the flame, the ash, the electric kiln is completely neutral. It doesn't care. It just elements heat up and cool down. And so mm -hmm. all of the surface activity is imparted by me and how I apply, apply glazes, right? But I mm -hmm. use glazes that are very unpredictable. So I'm, I'm continuing that unpredictability of firing. It's just now more imposed by me than, than by the process. So you have sort of more control and more act, more ability to sort of manage what that is. And, and I love this piece. This piece is beautiful. I saw it on, uh, you know, among your collection. And, oh. you know, the, the color is incredible. And this, I love the sort of the surface tension and the sort of the, the texture you create with your glazes, which seem to be very different than many other artists. Is there some 
process you use or is it simply your selection of the kind of glazes you use and is unusual from, from other things that we might see? Right, yeah, that's, um, so the glazes I use, I make myself and, and most of them I've actually formulated myself, but they're very dry and matte. You know, you're used to glass, the glassy surface right. of ceramic. Yeah, and, very, and very, you know, we, we're used to slick, you know, it looks, it looks shiny and, and this is not at all, this is much more earthy to get back to one right. of the things you said earlier, yeah. Yeah, so I, th those are the glazes I formulate. Um, this piece actually, the two bottom pieces, the two sort of spherical pieces. This sort of area here, uh-huh. Yeah, they were two individual pieces that were little vases and they were fired and done. And then one night in the studio, I just kind of leaned them together, built clay on top of them, and then built that uh, elongated arch to connect them and stuck them all back together. So this was not here originally, and then this looks like this was, was this the, was it, was it this color originally, this sort of bluish teal? Mm, probably some or, of that underneath, yeah. yeah. So each one was glazed separately, and they were considered finished pieces as, as just kind of small, little rough uh, organic bases, and then I, I just kind of joined them and forced them together through glaze and, and clay and fused them all into a different form. Beautiful, really incredible work. Here we're back to something that's a, again a little like like a painting, but I was really intrigued at the the vertical 